Hi, it's Clyde Yancey here once again at the 2011 American College of Cardiology meeting where we're discussing the late breaking clinical trials. We're delighted to have this segment on the heart.org called Trials and PIs, and I'm especially enthused that for this segment we have the PI for what may be the most relevant and the most newsworthy trial at the entire meeting. That's Craig Smith from Columbia University who's going to talk to us about the partners trial. Craig, welcome. Delighted to have thank, you here. Thank you for having me. Let me remind everyone that we've already heard a part about the partners trial because in the fall we were informed that the study arms that compared patients who underwent percutaneous aortic valve replacement versus the natural history of critical aortic stenosis derived a tremendous benefit from receiving the percutaneous aortic valve. We had not yet, however, seen what happened in the comparison of those who were operable candidates, albeit at higher risk, who received either the percutaneous aortic valve or underwent conventional aortic valve replacement. And Dr. Smith has those results, and so it is a delight to hear those results from you for the audience that listens to theheart.org. So set this up again for us. Tell us what the hypothesis was and how this fits in with the previous studies and who the patient population is. Okay, as you very well summarized, we knew from the previous study that inoperable patients derive great benefit from the transcatheter valve replacement, 20 plus percent difference in survival at one year. So and that's it, an absolute difference, not yes, a difference. Yes, that's an absolute difference. And that was a superiority design, clearly superior to standard treatment. So the, the question here was, compared to what has been the gold standard, aortic, surgical aortic valve replacement, uh, how will that look compared to the next little subset, which is patients who are at very high risk for surgery? Uh, any surgeon knows that patients in that group very often would be nice if you didn't have to operate on them. Mm -hmm and a logical next place to look. So this, this study was focused on patients at quite high risk for conventional surgery compared to the transcatheter replacement in that, in that population. So why don't we share with our audience what your definition was for quite high risk. I'm impressed that it actually was a quantitative definition. Well, it was about as quantitative as we can make it uh, today or maybe ever. Uh, the, the site surgeon and site cardiologist, or surgeons and cardiologists, in fact, had to decide that their, their estimated all-in perioperative risk was greater than 15%. Uh, in addition to that, there was a very, fairly strictly applied guideline of an STS risk score right. of at least 10. So this was, if you think of it in terms of the STS risk guideline, we're talking about 4.5% or less of the entire world's experience with aortic valve replacement, if I look at it that way, because that is the fraction of the STS database that uh, contains the greater than 10 patients. Sure. So it's a small segment of the, of the population we currently operate on, but very high risk. So tell us about the patient population that came forward then for this study. Well, they were just what we've seen in all the other transcatheter valves, elderly, average age about 83. Uh, the average STS risk score was 11.8, so as we were hoping to find, high risk by that yardstick. All very symptomatic, 90 plus percent, class 3, class 4. So uh, an elderly, symptomatic population, a variety of other comorbidities that you expect to see in this population, peripheral vascular disease, COPD, atrial fibrillation in 40 percent, things of that sort. How many in each arm? Uh, so, well, there's 699 in the high risk surgical arm. Mm -hmm. It was a double-armed approach, so patients with vascular access were randomized in a separately powered arm transfemoral transcatheter valve versus aortic valve, and that group was about two-thirds of the total. Sure. The other arm that was patients without vascular access were randomized transapical transcatheter valve against surgical valve. That was 103 in, in one and 102 in the other, so that was about 200 plus patients, about a third of the total. So talk us through the results, because that's really the big news. Well, it was a non-inferiority design, so the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality at one year, designed to show that the test device, transcatheter valve, was non-inferior to conventional surgery. So the result is that at, at one year, all-cause mortality, the difference was about 2% in both arms. And doing the non-inferiority calculation, that's a highly significant p-value, p.001. So 
using the test that's applied to demonstrate non-inferiority, the endpoint was easily met. Same was true of the separately powered transfemoral subset. Sure. Also highly significant p-value, clearly equivalent, at least in the sense that you can apply that term to a non-inferiority conclusion. Uh, excellent alternative to conventional open heart valve replacement in that population. So when we talk about morbidity, there were some differences that were seen between the two arms. Yes, yes. So let's discuss that for yeah. a bit. Well, that is the other half of the story, of course. And as was seen in the inoperable cohort, there was a greater frequency of stroke and major vascular injury in the transcatheter group. Uh, although the difference has come down 20 to 30 percent just between the inoperable co cohort and this one, the fact remains that, it's, that stroke is about twice as frequent. In fact, all neurologic events are about mm -hmm. twice as frequent in the transcatheter group as in the surgical group. It's still a small enough number that by the time you get through analyzing it and break it down into major stroke, the p-value has fallen below the level of significance. But not surprising given a small number of events, still twice as many occurring in the transcatheter group. So you know, what the FDA likes to call a signal remains mm -hmm. present for stroke, but it's decreasing, expected to de decrease further with time and experience, we have to assume. Same true for vascular injuries. Sure. They have already decreased somewhat from, from the first round. Uh, everyone would assume that that's somewhat device related, mm -hmm. and as the device gets smaller, which it already is becoming, that that will decrease as well. And then on the surgical side, there were some <coughs> unique yep. comorbidities. Uh, there were, things. absolutely, and there were things that you would absolutely expect to sure. find. So uh, certainly more patients after open heart surgery had major bleeding as it was defined. Uh, a great deal of the major bleeding definition depended on transfusion. Sure. So, of course, uh, you, you would expect open heart patients to get more transfusion. So there was a substantial difference in that favoring transcatheter valve, much more frequent bleeding, major bleeding in the surgical group. Same true for new onset atrial fibrillation, which is another well-recognized, not infrequent consequence right. of open heart surgery. So uh, you, I would, would have been very surprised if that weren't true, and it was true here. So those two things stand out on either side. Uh, no one, I think, expects, well, first of all, no one should be surprised that those things were found in the surgical group, and no one expects that this is the platform from which we'll see improvement in those values, because that's sort of the tried and true. Uh, what we need to see is improvement on the transcatheter side sure. in those key comorbidities or the key uh, uh, safety endpoints. I want to wrap up with two questions. One of the questions is, what's the take-home message? And the next question <coughs> is, where is this field of percutaneous aortic valve intervention going? But let me start the wrap-up, if you'll allow, and say I'm impressed that for these patients at higher operative risk, surgical aortic valve replacement was still a very good option for these patients. They were operated on at a very acceptable morbidity mortality rate, and so it could be that one of the lessons we've learned here is that we need to rethink what it is that constitutes operative risk for these patients, provided we were working in a center that has surgeons who can reproduce the same sort of results you saw. Okay, well, that's, you make a very good point, and I'll come back to that in a second, because I'd say the major take-home is that going forward, patients who are anywhere near that high-risk group, it, it begins to appear the transcatheter technology, even as it, as it exists today, is a very good alternative. Right. Getting back to your question, what we don't know is how far down the risk threshold we should move and how fast. And it, it gets to your point, and you know, it seems odd that the surgeon, me, is the <laughs> one who always seems to forget to mention the fact that the surgical performance in this trial was really exceptional. So that the observed to expected was 0 0.68, so excellent performance on the surgical side, meaning, or one implication as you're saying, as we start moving down the risk threshold, do we move down the risk threshold evenly across all institutions with all levels of experience, or does this sort of a thing need to be taken into account? Uh, does it mean we need to fine-tune our risk assessment strategies and algorithms? Probably so, but a uh, lot to be learned in the next years, but uh, what will be happening pretty quickly is that the trials coming out and experience in the marketplace will show this technology moving 
down from the very high risk into lower risk patients. I hope that as it follows that progression that the product iterations you discuss will follow suit as yes. well because that's very important. Yes, everyone hopes that because if that doesn't happen then we'll be moving down into the low risk strata and hurting people. So right. we don't want to see that. Craig, I really want to thank no, you. It's been pleasure. a pleasure to visit with you. This is Clyde Yancey at the 2011 American College of Cardiology meeting discussing the late-breaking clinical trials on the heart.org segment, Trials in PI. Again, we had a wonderful conversation with Craig Smith about the partner study. Great information. I hope this has been informative for you. Thank you for your attention.